Okay, well, I think we can go ahead and get started, Gary, if you're, if you're ready to go. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Gary Froyland as today's plenary speaker. Gary Froyland did his undergraduate studies in pure and applied math at the University of Queensland in Australia and received his PhD from the University of Western Australia in applied math in 1997. After several postdocs and a stint at working for BHP Billiton for about three years, he started as a lecturer at the University of New South Wales in 2004, where he is now a professor. Gary is on the editorial board of several journals, including Physica D and the Siam Journal of Applied Dynamical Systems. Gary has significantly influenced the fields of dynamical systems and ergodic theory and has made major contributions to discrete optimization. His work has greatly enriched our understanding of mixing and transport in complex geophysical fluid flows and the role of coherent structures. He's pioneered the usage of set-oriented methods and the transfer operator into the realm of geophysical fluid dynamics. A particular hallmark of Gary's research is that it is typically both mathematically highly sophisticated, involving theorem-proof style papers, as well as highly relevant and applications-oriented, working with, for example, oceanographers or solving problems in open pit mining. Today, Gary will share with us his insights on data-driven numerical tools that can tease apart dynamic components of the ocean. So I wanna thank everyone for, for joining us today for this, for this plenary of the SIAM MPE 20 series. I ask that you utilize the chat function if you have any questions as Gary goes through his talk today. And at the end, I'll read them out for Gary and we'll respond then, but feel free to use the chat um, during during the talk as questions arise in your mind and with that thank you thank you for joining us gary please take it away from here thank you very much jessica and uh thank you to the organizers including jessica and georg for the opportunity to speak here uh i would like to also say good morning uh, good afternoon and good evening to everyone tuning in uh, thank you for making it especially those of you for whom it's very early or very late I want to begin by showing my respects and acknowledging the Bedigal people, who are the traditional custodians of the land and of elders past, present and emerging on which this meeting takes place. So why do we care about the ocean? <clears throat> well, the ocean is an integral part of our Earth system. It is constantly in motion and it pumps huge amounts of heat from the tropics to the poles. It's the main player in the water cycle, evaporation and precipitation. And um, it is, uh, it's a key part of the, uh, the carbon cycle as well. So it's absorbing carbon, it's storing carbon, it's releasing carbon. And uh, inter it interacts with our atmosphere to create variability in our weather and our climate. And today I want to focus on the physical dynamics of the ocean. And to illustrate that, I'm going to play an animation, <clears throat> excuse me, prepared by my PhD student, Michael Dennis. So this is uh, surface speed, and uh, you can see some fast moving currents like the Gulf Stream off the East US coast, uh, moving across the Pacific to closer to my part of the world. You can see the East Australian current heading down the, uh, the East Australian coast. Uh, similar currents appear on other East Coasts. So near South Africa, you have the Agulhas current spinning off eddies, these ring-like objects you see here. And I'm going to start my talk off the seas of Antarctica. So you have the Weddell Sea uh, here, <clears throat> and around here you have the Ross Sea. So the ocean is a dynamic place, and I want to answer <clears throat> four questions in my talk. So uh, the first of these is, where does water recirculate for very long times? In other words, which spatially fixed regions mix poorly with other regions, particularly those surrounding regions. Second, once you've found one of these regions, how can you map escape times from these recirculating regions? Third, on the surface ocean, you have areas of convergence and what are the pathways by which water enters these regions? 
And fourth, where are spatially mobile regions that have relatively little interaction with the surrounding ocean? So four is, <clears throat> four is like a, uh, a mobile version of one, where in one we're looking at spatially fixed regions, and in four we're looking at spatially mobile regions. So how can we answer these questions with models and direct observations? I'm going to do this through some case studies. So for question one, I'm going to look at Antarctic gyres using a model. Similarly for question two. For question three, I'm going to look at this through <clears throat> the lens of uh, garbage patches, plastic garbage patches, using both data and, um, and a model. And for question four, I'll look at features at a variety of spatial scales using, again, both observational data and models. Okay, so I'm going to take a dynamical systems approach and my key tool is going to be the transfer operator. So I'll spend a slide introducing that. In the background, I have the dynamics being generated by some time dependent vector field on some domain in either R2 or R3. So for me, this is going to be really, if it's R3, this is a physical piece of the ocean. Uh, if it's R2, then it's, a, it's some kind of slice through the ocean. And for small epsilon, I'm going to consider the SDE <clears throat> driven by uh, our velocity field and the addition of some small Brownian motion. Now, I'm not going to be interested in individual trajectories, rather, I'm going to be talking about the evolution of ensembles of trajectories. And throughout my talk, I'll talk about mass distribution. So you can think of a mass distribution, if you like, as an ensemble of trajectories, how those are distributed. Or you can think of it as the, uh, the distribution of a chemical or, or simply water mass. So how do these mass distributions evolve forward? <clears throat> they evolve according to the advection diffusion of the Planck equation, shown here. So you have the, uh, the advection term and the diffusion term. And at a fixed point in space, you have the instantaneous change of the evolution uh, with respect to time. Now, if I want to evolve this forward, this distribution forward in time, some, some time tau, say, I need to get the solution operator for this PDE, but it's a linear PDE, so my solution operator is a linear operator, and it's known as the transfer operator or Perron Frobenius operator. So uh, if I want to evolve some initial distribution forward in time, tau time units, then I apply push forward with this linear operator called the transfer operator, and that brings me to the, uh, the mass distribution at this future time tau. So the transfer operator transforms densities to densities. As a linear operator, it is a positive operator and it is integral preserving. And for positive epsilon and tau, it's a compact operator, which is going to be useful when we start to talk about spectra. So that was the maths. Uh, in, in pictures, what is this operator doing? Uh, this is a simulation where we placed synthetic garbage at the coastlines of the world. So by synthetic, I mean on, a computer, on our computers. Uh, and we let this uh, evolve according to the surface ocean currents. And the transfer operator pushes this initial distribution of plastic mass at the, uh, at the coastlines out into the ocean. And it evolves, as you see here in the red. So this is, a, this is a visual demonstration of what the transfer operator is doing. It's pushing forward mass distributions. Now, uh, the spectrum of this operator by uh, the, by the uh, positivity and integral preservation, it's easy to show that it has to be confined to the unit disk in the complex plane. The picture you see here is the numerical spectrum for the transfer operator in the movie that I just showed you and indeed it's inside the unit circle. Uh, if the dynamics is mixing, and I don't want to say precisely what that is here, uh, then there's a unique eigenvalue one, so that's over here. And the corresponding eigenfunction gives the time asymptotic distribution of trajectories or the invariant density. So by that, I mean, again, in, in pictures, if I were to run this movie forward in time to time infinity, I would converge to some distribution of red and uh, that would be the invariant distribution, a fixed point of the transfer operator or its eigenvalue, uh, sorry, its eigenfunction corresponding to eigenvalue one. I'm mostly gonna be concerned with the remaining eigenfunctions of the transfer operator. So these 
By the integral preservation, these have to be signed. So they're signed mass distributions. They take both positive and negative values and they decay at the rates given by the magnitude of the, of the corresponding eigenvalues. So in particular, the eigenvalue lambda two quantifies the slowest time asymptotic decay. And the eigen equation for that eigen function looks like this. You take F2, you hit it with the transfer operator, you scale down by lambda two to the tau. Uh, and if lambda two happens to be real and close to one, then on the right hand side, what you get here is something that is very close to F2. So very little decay. How does decay occur? Decay happens by the positive parts and the negative parts of, of the signed distribution interacting in space and, um, and canceling out. So if there is very little decay, that means there's very little interaction and these positive and negative parts of the distribution do not interact much in phase space and they are close to invariant or almost invariant. So this idea, which is due to Donuts and Junger from their 99 paper, uh, extends to further eigenvalues up to a gap in the spectrum. This is time asymptotic. If you want to look at finite time, then there is a, a modification that you should make to look at finite time almost invariant sets. I want to try and visualize this F2 in the same way I visualized F1. So uh, this is not the ocean, but at least it's a fluid. Uh, on the left, what you have is, um, so you've got a thin uh, quasi 2D film. This is in the lab. You've got fluorescent dye on the left, and this is being periodically forced from uh, beneath. On the right, you see a snapshot every period of the forcing. And what you see on the right is it appears to be converging to some kind of fixed distribution of the dye. And this is convergence to the F2. So think of green as plus one, black as minus one. You are converging to this signed distribution. Now, the fluid here is incompressible. So uh, as, as a dynamical system, it's area preserving. And in the long run, as time goes to infinity, the green dye will spread uniformly over the space distributed according to area. But at these intermediate times that you see the duration of the movie, you have a slow mixing, mixing structure captured by these uh, almost invariant sets and F2, and that is impeding this uh, uniform uh, distribution. So these F2 are known as strange eigenmodes, persistent patterns, uh, and can be used to find almost invariant sets. So we'd like to apply these almost invariant set ideas to the ocean, but of course, to do that, we need some numerical representation of our transfer operator. And here is uh, what I'm going to use for most of the talk. X is going to be my ocean domain, as we said before. Uh, I'm going to put a grid on X, and I'm going to create a transition matrix between grid cells. So in my cartoon, uh, in, this, in this red set, I've populated with uh, 36 points, test points. These test points are evolved by our ODE or our SDE, or they might even come from data. They may be trajectories that we observe. So some way we get trajectories and then we see where they land tau time units later. And in the picture here, we see that five of them landed in this box. So we say with probability five over 36, a randomly chosen point in this box is landing in this box after a flow time of tau. So I do that for all pairs of boxes. And if there are N uh, boxes or grid cells, then I get an N by N transition matrix P tau. And this P tau is the discrete representation of my transfer operator. Okay, so let's look at Antarctic gyres. So in the, um, uh, this is, okay, let me orient you here. So this is Antarctica. Okay, I'm, I'm over here somewhere. Uh, in, the, in the Weddell Sea, uh, you have the Weddell Gyre. Uh, in the Ross Sea, you have the Ross Gyre. These are large uh, wind-driven gyres. They're recirculating masses of water. They are largely dynamically disconnected from the surrounding water. So water parcels that begin in the gyres, they can live there for a long time before they escape the gyre. So these are good candidates to try and diagnose as almost invariant sets. They're important for the physics and the biogeochemistry of the region. Uh, they're seasonal because uh, the winds, for example, are stronger in, in the winter. So we do expect some, some seasonal changes. 
Um, if you want to diagnose gyre extend on the surface, then a kind of classical way of doing this is to look at sea surface height contours, and these you can get by satellite altimetry. Uh, but we had shown in some work um, a little earlier than what I'm showing you here that uh, even on the surface, uh, these almost invariant set ideas can uh, find sets that are more disconnected than you would get from sea surface height contours. So in summary, I want to investigate the seasonal variation of these dryers and I want to uh, get the dryer extent in three dimensions. So to do this, I'm going to put a, a large three dimensional domain over the Southern Ocean. Uh, the top view of that domain is what you see on the right. And this is, this is a cylinder that extends down to the sea floor. So you're just looking at the top in this picture. The trajectories we generate from a quarter degree global ocean model called ORCA. Uh, it's got 46 vertical depth layers. It's, uh, we're going to integrate over this year. The domain itself is discretized into 140,000 boxes. We have 500 particles per box. And because we're looking at seasons, I'm going to flow for three months. Okay, so for each of the seasons. Now, on the right, what you're looking at is one of these signed distributions I was talking about. So this is an eigenfunction of the transfer operator that we've computed. Uh, it's in 3D, I'm just looking at the surface. And uh, so blue is something like minus one, red is plus one, and you can already see that the blue is you know, roughly where you expect the Weddell dryer to be, and the red is roughly where you expect the Ross dryer to be. Now what I'm going to do in the later pictures is to uh, threshold on the value of the eigenvector or the, or the color in this picture, if you like, and choose the threshold that is giving the least leaky object. So uh, in the remaining pictures, I've already done this thresholding and cutting away. Uh, and uh, this is, um, these are the four seasons. So uh, again, this is just looking from the top. So you've got summer, uh, autumn, winter, and spring. And you can already see some variation here. This is the 3D uh, view for summer. So on the right, you've got the Weddell gyre, on the uh, left, the Ross. Uh, north is into the page, east and west of the usual orientation, east to the right, west to the left, and the surface is here, and this is going down to the sea floor. So you can compute some statistics, like um, if you initialize water in the Weddell gyre on the right, and then you flow for three months, how much water is retained in that fixed object uh, you can easily calculate from the transition matrix, 92.7% is retained after the three months. So that's summer. In winter, you see that the Weddell dryer is uh, significantly shallower. In autumn, uh, sorry, that was autumn. In winter, uh, both gyres are um, becoming shallow. And then in spring, the Weddell dryer is then cycling back again in depth towards its, towards its summer depth. So to recap what we've done here, we, we wanted to diagnose the Antarctic gyres as, the sl as slow mixing objects or least leaky objects. And we put a, 3D, a large 3D domain over the polar cap. And we asked what are the slowest mixing objects in that polar cap that are, that are fixed in space. And we pull out the, the two uh, Antarctic gyres. So can we say more about the internal structure of the gyres uh, in addition to just uh, this is their extent. So this brings me to uh, the second part of my talk about escape times. So I've been looking for sets that are least leaky, but they are still leaky. So, you know, 92.7% remained in the dryer. That means that 7% left. So they're still leaking. Uh, how long does water remain inside before it escapes? Let G be our uh, dryer in 3D and as a 3D set. And uh, let calligraphic I be all the boxes that make up the gyre. So um, this, is, this is consisting of a whole bunch of little boxes. So you take all the indices of those. And then for each one of those boxes, what I want to calculate is the expected time it takes for water initialized there to escape from the gyre. So once I've got all those numbers, put them together in a vector. And to get this vector, I should solve this linear system. Now, uh, this is a sparse linear system, so you've got the identity, which is obviously sparse. Our matrix P is typically very sparse, 
and uh, so this is uh, this is very easy to solve. The, this vector here is a vector of ones. Uh, nicely, at the level of operators, without the discretization, you still have the same kind of form. So escape time as a function of space is this linear operator acting on the indicator function of the gyre, which is also obviously a function of 3D space. Where does this expression come from? Uh, well, it's a, it's a classical uh, proof in, in Markov chains. I've appended it to the slide, um, but I'm not going to go through it here. It's there if you want to come back, I guess in one or two weeks, one or two weeks time when this is put up. Uh, the, let's go on to some computations. So uh, this is the Weddell gyre. Uh, I'm showing the escape time field uh, for summer, autumn, winter, and spring. And the scale here is going from zero years of residence, which is equivalent to escape, um, up to 12 years of residence. And uh, I'm slicing, this is a 3D computation, but I'm slicing here for visualization through the, the latitude 64 south. So as you might expect, um, if you're initialized toward the interior of the dry, you stay there longer than if you were initialized near the periphery, but not uniformly so. And also interesting is in the autumn and winter when the gyre is more shallow, you have a stronger core in the sense that water is remaining for longer, uh, indicated by this pink, which is up to 10 years or slightly more than 10 years of residence. So this was, uh, this was using a, uh, a model to get this, this extra information about the dynamics internal to the almost invariant set. Um, I just want to quickly mention we did essentially the same calculations um, in the Gulf of Mexico in 2D at depth where we got the transition matrix from floats. So you can also construct the transition matrix from observations. Okay, so the third part of my talk is about um, domains of attraction. And I've already shown you this movie. Plastic was accumulating in these, in these red areas. Why is that happening? Uh, these areas are known convergence zones for surface water. So surface water is, is coming together and it's then descending to, to downwell. The plastic is floating with the, with the currents, but uh, when, the, when the, the water is coming together and descending, the plastic is floating, it cannot descend. And so it just accumulates on the surface in these, in these uh, red regions. Uh, this, this has been constructed, this movie has been constructed from, from drift observations um, from the Global Drifter Program. Uh, what does the plastic look like in these areas? Uh, it's usually made up of tiny, tiny pieces that have been broken down by the sun and uh, the waves. Uh, the pieces, I mean, it, it's like a very thin soup of plastic and um, the pieces are very small. They're easily ingested by marine animals maybe ultimately us in some cases. And um, it's very hard to get out of the ocean because the pieces are so small and so thinly distributed. So we should definitely stop putting plastic in the ocean. Now I'm going to switch to uh, a model. So the ocean global circulation model for the Earth simulator or OFES. Um, it's on a 10th degree grid. We've got observed winds from uh, uh, reanalysis because we want to get the dynamics on the surface correct. Um, here I'm showing you something similar to what I showed you in the, the uh, garbage movie. I'm initializing with a uniform distribution of water mass and then this is being evolved uh, forward in time uh, using our transition matrix. So our transition matrix here, we've got 10,000 boxes, uh, we had 100 particles per box and we've evolved over the year uh, 2001. So this is what happens to a uniform distribution after two years. This is 10 years, 100 years, and 1,000 years. And you see accumulation in the same kinds of areas that you saw in the, in the animation before. Uh, so yeah, this is, I mean, this is just another way of uh, looking at it from a model. Um, to get this final picture, what we did is something very uh, trivial, which is to take a vector of ones which represents uh, a uniform distribution on the ocean surface and then and then hit that vector a thousand times with the sparse matrix p so that that's how this picture was produced for example 
Okay, so because each garbage patch is a sink, if we're in the language of deterministic dynamical systems, we could ask about the basin of attraction for each patch. And part of the motivation for this work was we were thinking, well, we have these patches, can we, uh, can we find out where the, where the plastic is coming from to enter these patches? Could we even assign a kind of proportional blame to different countries for contributing their plastic to individual patches? We have a transition matrix here, and so the way to think about this in, in Markov chain language is to say, well, um, the sinks are absorbing sets, the basins of attraction are places where you have uh, positive absorption probabilities, uh, probabilities of absorption to those absorbing sets. And so in the idealized setting where you've got K separate attracting sets that I'm denoting A1 to AK, and each of these has a distinct basin of attraction, then your transition matrix P is going to have K eigenvalues one, and you'll be able to find right eigenvectors VK that have the following form. So uh, if a box I is in the kth attracting set, then the ith entry of the kth vector will be one. If the ith box is not in the kth attracting set and not even in the basin of attraction for the kth attracting set, then you'll get a zero. And these two are just special cases of the general formula, which is the absorption probability of the ith state or the ith box into the kth attracting set. So in the ideal case, we could find these basins of attraction through the, through the right eigenvectors. Uh, in the non-ideal case, where you're constructing a transition matrix from an ocean model or, or ocean data, uh, you can uh, appeal to perturbation theory and say, well, I have something close to ideal. Instead of uh, an eigenvalue one with multiplicity k, I'm going to be perturbed to have an eigenvalue one, which I must have by stochasticity, and then k minus one eigenvalues that are close to one. My eigenspace made up of these nice vk's, uh, that is going to be also slightly perturbed. Because this is a singular perturbation, we are not going to uh, get, we can't say that individual vectors are uh, are perturbed. All we know is the five-dimensional eigenspace is perturbed, five-dimensional because we've got five garbage patches. So in general, the perturbed vectors we compute as eigenvectors are just going to be linear combinations of these Vs and we can't control that. On the left, you see these five eigenvectors from the P that I constructed and uh, in fact, you know, particularly this one, you see this is not a zero one structure. Okay. Uh, but uh, the, because we have mostly uh, zero one support structures for these Vs, when you take linear combinations, what you will see are level set structures in the eigenvectors. You can uh, hope for that and, and they will reveal the domains of attraction. So this is precisely what you see here. Uh, the, these mostly zeros and ones, have been put together in some linear combination and you see you've got one, two, three, four, five uh, regions where you have roughly the same color or the same value to the eigenvector. So you could be satisfied with this and say, well, here I can, kind of, I can clearly see where the domains of attraction are and that was what we said in this paper. Uh, but it would be nice to automatically disentangle the domains shown by approximate level values in the eigenvectors to uh, create basis vectors that are close to the canonical forms. And that is what I've done here. So on the left, we have the eigenvectors again. And on the right, uh, I have created a basis that is being rotated to put these vectors in the canonical form. So I applied an algorithm called sparse eigenbasis approximation, or SIBA. And what this does is identify an optimal five by five rotation matrix to send this basis into uh, a basis that is sparse. And why do I want sparse? Well, I want to have one basin of attraction per vector. So here uh, I have a value of one, the blue is a value of zero, and I want just one basin of attraction, so this representation will be, will be sparse. 
here's the algorithm that I use to do it, but it doesn't have much to do with oceans. And so it's on the slides. You can come back and see a one page description of that. Uh, I want to go on and um, interpret these basins of attraction. So what this means is that if you're a water parcel over here, you have very high likelihood to get sucked over into the South Pacific gyre, uh, uh, patch rather, gyre and patch, I guess. Uh, if you are a water parcel here, then it's very likely that you're brought into the South Atlantic patch. If you're in the South, uh, sorry, if you're in the North Pacific patch, well, you know that you must have come from pretty much the North Pacific. There is no other pathway into the North Pacific. So individually, this is useful information to have. You can superimpose these basins into a single picture by maximum likelihood. So that would mean just maximizing box wise. And you see they fit together to make uh, an almost partition of the surface ocean. Um, what is interesting is the, the boundaries. So for example, this boundary here says that if you were just a little bit to the southwest of uh, so to the south of the southwest tip of Australia, then you head into the South Pacific patch. If you're a little to the north, then you go up into the Indian patch. Similarly, if you're a little to the south of this tip of South Africa, you go into the Indian. If you're a little to the north, then you recirculate back into the, into the South Atlantic patch. So um, these blue regions here show you the, the, uh, the kind of knife edge or uh, uncertain areas where if, if you're a water beginning there, it's not clear which you, know, you can go either way. Uh, around here where you have three of these basins coming together, you have a rather large uncertain region. Okay, so that brings me to part four of my talk where uh, I'm going to talk about slow mixing, mobile slow mixing objects. So uh, at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned uh, Antarctic gyres as uh, slow mixing fixed in space objects. And now I want to talk about the same idea, slow mixing objects, but now the objects can move in space. Okay, so I'm going to allow them to move in space. This will mean that I really need some kind of uh, time dependent or non-autonomous analysis. Uh, one of the canonical examples is uh, ocean eddies. So what you are seeing here in gray are three Excuse ocean Gary? eddies. Yes. I think um, this figure is, is just appearing all black on our presentation. Is it is it looking that way on your screen as well? No, I have a lovely movie on my screen. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> sure. Um, I don't know if you could do anything about it now, but I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> okay, uh, I can, I guess, run it outside. Um, can you see that? Yes, very much so. Thank you. Okay, okay. so um, the, yeah, the gray here are, are ocean eddies and uh, they, are, they are slow mixing because if, if water is beginning in the eddy, then it's very difficult to mix outside uh, the eddy. So there is slow mixing locally to the, uh, to the eddies um, in terms of water going in and out of the eddy. The blue set, which we just randomly placed, uh, is, as you can see, very quickly getting uh, torn apart and mixed in the surrounding water. So the blue is uh, incoherent or rapidly mixing and the gray are um, slow mixing or, or coherent. So as I've argued, um, Coherent transport in a domain is equivalent to slow mixing in parts of the domain. And we can use the transfer operator to again define a sequence of signed mass distributions that mix most slowly over a finite flow time. So now we have a specific flow time uh, from T0 to T0 plus tau. Mixing again occurs by decay of these signed distributions. So you take your F, you hit it with uh, P tau, and it will decay in the L2 norm by some factor lambda. And if we're looking for several of these objects, we want to find several lambda. They should be as close to one as possible. That will mean least mixing. And it turns out that these optimal values are the singular values of the transfer operator, at least in the case where, where V is uh, divergence free. If it's divergent, you need uh, a simple weighting of this to, to correct for that. 
uh, and the corresponding sign distributions are the, uh, the singular vectors. In particular, the, sing the singular value lambda 2 quantifies the slowest decay over this time interval. And again, uh, we need to, if we want to apply this to the ocean, implement it numerically, and we're going to stick with the transition matrix approach that we've already looked at. So in one slide, I want to uh, uh, quickly uh, go through this because I want to move on to uh, another technique. So what I'm doing here is I want to diagnose one of these eddies that I showed you in the movie um, uh, as the slowest mixing 3D object. So what I do is I put a, a cube around where I think the, the eddy might be. And what you see here is um, the surface expression of that cube. And I compute my transition matrix using uh, trajectories from the Orca model over this six month period. So we're looking at a six month flow time. And this is the second singular vector. So uh, red is, is plus one, and you see this uh, uh, circular object, which is, which is the surface expression of the eddy. We threshold again, cutting away the rest of the ocean in a threshold that maximizes the um, uh, not, well, I guess, minimizes the leakage, maximizes the coherence. Uh, and we're left with this uh, 3D object here, which is the uh, eddy at uh, 1st of May. And then six months later, the eddy travels over here to this darker concentration of water. The, the blue cloud is the water that leaks out. So there is, of course, some, some leakage, but um, we can get the, uh, the positions at the beginning and the end of the flow time. Uh, as the slowest mixing objects in, in this cubic domain as singular vectors of the, of the transfer operator. Okay, now I want to uh, switch gears a little bit to talk uh, uh, more about geometry. So um, I've had this epsilon floating around in my talk since the beginning and the epsilon has been useful uh, to, to give me some diffusion, to help me with mixing and to make the, the maths uh, nice in terms of uh, giving me a compact operator. So my spectrum is, uh, is uh, yeah, not, uh, not singular. So uh, if I look at this, uh, this 2D object here and I think about a deterministic evolution of that object as indicated here under some nonlinear flow, in the absence of diffusion, if I just have deterministic dynamics, how would a point inside the object get outside the object? Well, uh, it can't because the boundary of the object is flowing with the same uh, dynamics. So this is this what's called a material object. Uh, the, 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 there can be no mixing uh, just by deterministic flow. On the other hand, if I have some diffusion indicated by this gray band, uh, so I have diffusion of a certain amplitude, then as long as I'm within this gray band, then there's, there's some positive probability that uh, the diffusion will kick me outside this object uh, uh, or vice versa or could bring me in and, and mixing can occur. So the total amount of mixing occurring over this flow time is, is proportional to the total area of the gray region. In, in, in all the images. So you know, here, here I have more gray area than, than over here. And it's this area that is minimized by the singular vectors of the transfer operator. This is how that method works. What if I were to shrink epsilon down to zero? What if I shrink this band down to zero width? Then what I would end up with is just the length of the boundary or the interface. So in this pure advection limit, the, it's the length of the boundary or the size of the interface that determines the amount of mixing. Okay. So we could have an equivalent geometric characterization of slow mixing as finding interfaces that remain persistently small over the flow time that we're interested in. Now, that, that's, that's the intuition. There's, uh, there's some maths that you can do to, uh, to connect this with what we've seen before. So I've talked about singular vectors of the transfer operator, and this is of course the same as an eigenvector of the transfer operator multiplied by its adjoint. So if I take this object here, this, this product, if I were to send epsilon to zero, then what would happen in the limit is I would deterministically push forward my, my distribution 
And then the adjoint would deterministically pull it back and I would get back exactly to where I began and I would have just applied the identity operator. So I would have no, there's no dynamical information there. So what you have to do is look at higher order terms. So you should subtract off the identity, rescale by epsilon squared, then take your limit. And now you get something interesting. Uh, in this limit, you get the Laplace operator, plus you get a pullback of the Laplace operator from the future and the combination from the terminal time. And the combination of these two is the dynamic Laplace operator. So in this small diffusion regime, the eigenvectors of this operator should be close to the singular vectors of the transfer operator. The fact that you've got Laplaces in here allows you to connect with geometry. So you can, you can look at existing results in uh, differential geometry and isoparametric theory that talks about minimal surfaces. And you can, you can make a theory of uh, persistently minimal surfaces that are connected to the eigenfunctions of the dynamic Laplacian. So you get a dynamic spectral geometry on manifolds for general time dependent nonlinear dynamics. Uh, and what I'm going to show you, instead of just uh, having Laplace at the initial and the pullback from the final, you can uh, combine pullbacks uh, throughout the flow time. And I'm going to look at discrete versions of this in, in, um, in what comes next. Again, we have to, okay, this is a nice uh, operator theoretically, but we want to apply this to the ocean, so we need some numerical approximation. And, uh, well, people use finite element method for Laplace operator approximation. And in this paper, we uh, made a special version of this for our dynamic Laplace operator. All we need are positions of trajectories. So um, just like in the transfer operator methods, we don't at any time need to take any spatial derivatives, which would be bad because we want to apply this to sparse data into noisy data. Uh, as you'll see, this is going to be based on a mesh, so there are no parameters to select, and we're going to get estimates of the interfaces on the full phase space. So what you're looking at here is a movie of um, Argo floats over a six year period. What is an Argo float? Um, it's an expensive float that uh, descends to a thousand meters drifts around there for nine days or so, quickly descends to 2,000 meters, and then pops up to the surface, tells the satellite where it is, and repeats. So you have this roughly 10-day cycle, nine days of which are spent drifting around at 1,000 meters. Uh, we're going to look at six years of this data from mid-97, mid, uh, and we have around 3,000 floats at any one time, uh, but they're not the same floats, so you know, floats, their, their battery will die or they'll uh, get beached on the coast or they'll get otherwise lost. So they're continually leaving the data set. And at the same time, you have ships coming out and throwing new floats in the ocean. So um, they are also entering the data set. So you have this continual turnover of floats. And in fact, 90% of the floats have lifetimes less than the six years that we're looking at. So this is a, I mean, it's a sparse and uh, somewhat because of this reason, a challenging data set, but um, the method is uh, adapted to handle this. Uh, what we do is simply mesh the float positions, uh, in this case, at every month. And there's nothing very scientific about this video. <laughs> I just want to show you clearly what we're doing. Uh, in particular, we're not evolving the mesh. Okay, We are simply remeshing at every month the, part, the, the floats where they are. Uh, so then you use those meshes, you uh, construct your dynamic Laplacian, and you complete, uh, compute the leading eigenfunctions. And the basis we're using is the standard hat function basis. So um, if you're familiar with this, uh, every vertex of our mesh gives rise to a piecewise linear function called a hat function, whose graph is shown here. And um, this is the basis in which we compute. Uh, we need to separate the features using SIBA. So just like with the garbage uh, patch domain of attractions, the, these features are kind of mixed up and we need to unmix them. Uh, so we do that with SIBA and combine them in a single frame and that's what you're seeing here. So the red uh, can be interpreted as the slowest mixing objects at this very large kind of ocean basin scale uh, at the 1000 meter level. Um, 
if you want to think about small interfaces, you can look at maybe the yellow that kind of stands out as an interface. So that, that's remaining short, relatively short over the flow time. Um, you even pick up uh, the Weddell gyre at the, at the beginning here uh, before it disappears. If someone likes, they could ask me about that at the end. <laughs> okay, this is the, this is the same kind of uh, plot, but now we're just plotting the values at the floats themselves. And maybe here it's clearer to see that you have this slow mixing property, that the, the red floats are moving around in their own little neighborhood, but they're not uh, leaking out into the blue or, or, or communicating with another red neighborhood. Um, the, the objects here are not particularly mobile, uh, but that's just because at this scale, you don't, I mean, these slow, the slowest mixing objects tend not to be very mobile at this scale. Okay, so to finish, I want to uh, go down to a slightly smaller scale, namely a piece of the North Atlantic. And uh, I want to diagnose the slow mixing structures from, from a flow there. Now, probably again, Jessica, you see a black uh, rectangle here. Indeed. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, but you can see the text, I suppose. So let me just describe the, the text. Uh, we, what we're doing here is um, we're looking for coherent sets in the North Atlantic. The, the trajectories that you will shortly see uh, are 90 day uh, flow. We've got 50,000 of them and um, thank you to Arena Rapina from Hui for supplying those. Okay, so let me see if I can actually um, show you what this is supposed to be. Yeah, so now you see some trajectories here. Um, just to, that, that was my initial, uh, this is my initial uh, domain and then that flows for 90 days. Uh, this is the, this is, right, this is Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, New York is around here, okay. So the next thing I wanted to show you, I guess uh, I can just say what it is. Yeah, so, uh, so what we do is we mesh those particles, uh, we, we construct the dynamic Laplace and then we compute, uh, well, first of all, what we compute is the, just the second eigenfunction. And what you're showing, what you're seeing here is the second eigenfunction. So red is plus one, blue is minus one, and you uh, get this very clear separation uh, here, which is, which is the Gulf Stream. And uh, this, Interface is remaining short throughout the flow time as it is supposed to. We're looking for these persistently short interfaces because they correspond to slow mixing. And you can also see that there are very few red particles going into the blue area and vice versa. So the Gulf Stream is a known kind of, is a known uh, coherent feature because you have uh, cold water trapped uh, to the north and uh, warmer water to the south. And here we are able to uh, diagnose this interface uh, purely from the, uh, kinematically, I guess, purely from the point positions of the particles over the 90 day flow. Okay, and now again, I guess you see the, the black. Uh, what we're doing here is, um, Okay, what we're doing here is taking now many more eigenvectors of the dynamic Laplacian, uh, combining them using SIBA, and what you see is um, in, in red uh, a bunch of ocean eddies. So uh, again, the, the interfaces, what are the interfaces? The interfaces are the boundaries of the eddies. The interfaces are remaining short because they're just remaining as little circles. And you don't see any red or very little red going out into the blue and vice versa. So these are highly coherent features. They're very slow mixing features and we're able to extract these pretty clearly using these eigenfunctions of the dynamical Laplacian. So uh, that, that brings me to the end of my talk. So let me just summarize what we looked at. We had these four main pieces. First piece was we looked for fixed in space, minimally leaking regions or finite time, almost invariant sets. And we uh, got the gyre extent in 3D um, using this criterion. Then we looked at uh, escape time fields from the gyres. And to get that, we 
just solved a, a sparse linear system. Uh, then we looked at pathways into regions of convergence or basins of attraction and applied this to see where plastic is entering from where plastic is entering the plastic garbage patches. And then finally, we looked at mobile and space minimally leaking regions of finite time coherent sets and used this to uh, look at uh, Agulhas rings, the global ocean, the Gulf Stream, and eddies in the North Atlantic. And you could either get this by singular vectors of the transfer operator or equivalently eigenvectors of the genetic Laplace operator. So uh, these are the papers that are involved in what I showed you in the talk. And I would like to thank my uh, funders, mainly the Australian Research Council. And um, here are all the collaborators that were directly involved in the experiments that I showed you. So a big thank you to all of them. And uh, thank you to all of you for your attention. Thank you so much, Gary. This is the time that everyone we would be applauding if we were all sitting. With you. <laughs> so just just imagine that happening. Um, I just like to remind everybody that's online. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box. There are a few that I've seen come through, so I'll I'll go ahead and start to read those out for you, Gary. Okay. So the first question comes from Paul Leopardi, and he asks. How would this work influence the design and validation of large scale ocean modeling models? Uh, thank you for the easy question, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> uh, I guess I see this as a validation tool. So um, there are various predictions that you can test from, you know, you build your model and you want it to represent well uh, known uh, or physically realistic uh, dynamics. And so I see these methods as ways of testing that, uh, testing in, in, in rather uh, strict ways that your model reproduces something physically meaningful or something that, that you know should be, should be being reproduced. Okay, very good. Um, we have another question here from Itamar, and he's asking, is there any correspondence to Northern Hemisphere basins of attraction? Correspondence to? I think that's what he asked. Um, Itamar, if you're still online, I can allow you to, let's see if I can. Yeah, here, I'll, I'll let, Itamar speak for himself here. You should be unmuted. It was very early on when I saw just the southern hemisphere basins of attractions and I'm not oceanographer so I thought there must be something in the northern hemisphere too with some connection. Uh, you mean I oh, could have correspondence, namely if you have some gyre somewhere in the southern hemisphere ocean there must be some connection or on its own independently it is generated i may so, be wrong so you mean some uh, there should be some transmission some pathway between the north and the south yeah I, years ago i knew about teleconnection which is probably very different and another context, but teleconnection was connecting different parts of the ocean, right? Yes, uh, on the surface, uh, you have the strong, the strong equatorial currents. So um, you have, uh, th this is why you don't see much connection in the Pacific, for example. So you've got uh, the north and south equatorial currents, which are just slightly north and south of the equator, and they are, um, they're west traveling and then you've got the equatorial countercurrent that goes to the east. So these, these strong currents are why you don't see, uh, why it's hard to get north-south transmission across the Pacific, at least on the surface. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, you know, the, whole, the whole ocean, there's, there's, there's a subsea conveyor belt that is taking water around the entire ocean in 3D, but on the surface, you have these currents that impede that kind of transmission. Uh, you, to, similar, you can also see this here. They, they deviate a little from the equator here, but they're roughly where you see the blue uh, in the Atlantic here. So on the surface, you, you, you don't get so much transmission because of these currents. 
if that answers your question. I hope so. <laughs> so Gary, I have a question on, on this uh, front of the garbage patchwork. So, and forgive me if I, if I may have missed this, my children are, are squealing in the background getting ready for bed. But I, I heard that you were suggesting that one of the motivations for this work was to be able to identify um, potential sources of the pollution. So were you able to, or do you see in the future being able to make that determination? Uh, we, I mean, one of the main problems is that countries, some countries are not reporting so clearly. It's just very hard to get a handle on how much plastic is entering the ocean from particular countries. Some are not reporting and some it's simply very difficult. I mean, people leave rubbish at the coastline, but how do you know how much of that makes it into the ocean? How much is coming, is getting washed back to the coastline? I think <clears throat> there's a whole uh, community of people that are studying these kind of problems, trying to identify how much plastic is going into the ocean and, and, and what its source is. And so, no, we, we didn't get back to that, mainly because we didn't have enough data that we felt was good enough to make some kind of definitive study out of. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, a couple other questions have come through. Um, one from Demetrios. Have you considered the dynamics of bodies with inertia as opposed to pure advection diffusion? I believe this may be relevant in the dynamics of the garbage patches. Uh, I have not, but I, I know uh, some people have. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, I mean, it depends on what kind of garbage you are looking at. So, you know, once the plastic is broken into tiny pieces, it's essentially uh, just moving with the currents. If you had a very large piece, like a shipping container or some, <laughs> I don't know, something very large, then inertia effects are important. But um, I think the my understanding is that the vast, a large proportion of the mass of the plastic is made up of very small pieces. So I'm not, uh, for, for the plastic application in particular, I'm not sure if the inertia is so important, but I agree for, um, for other, other things, you certainly want to take inertia into account. Okay, and then finally, a question from John McLean. Is it feasible to compute the dynamic Laplacian on the fly as part of a numerical integration? That is, how computationally expensive is it? Uh, it's, it's pretty cheap. I mean, if you've worked with finite elements before, um, the, what we're using are standard uh, FEM methods that you would use in numerical analysis to compute um, the, the the usual pass operator. So actually constructing it is fast and probably the slowest part is computing the eigenvectors because um, <clears throat> it it ends up, I'm getting a little technical now, but it ends up uh, with, with uh, the, the matrix that you get is not necessarily, it tends to be a bit denser than you would get from the transition matrix approach. And so in summary, I would say the construction is fast and at the moment, um, for, for very large systems, the bottleneck is the is the eigen problem. Okay. All right. Well, I think you know we're about at eight o'clock here. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come through. So once again, I just want to thank you, Gary, for joining us today as our plenary speaker, and thank everyone in the audience for joining from around the world. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm.